Hey guys, it's Robbie. Let's cut to the chase. Lincoln, Massachusetts. If you're like me and not from New England, you're probably not familiar with it as a town. With a population of around 7,000, it's definitely one of the smaller settlements in the state, and it gets overshadowed by places such as Boston, Cambridge, and Worcester. However, it plays a pretty significant role in today's story. In the 1970s, two students at Lincoln Sudbury Regional High School met for the first time. Their names were John Linnell and John Flansburg. From this point on, I'll be referring to them exclusively by their last name for simplicity's sake. Both being musicians, they quickly became close friends. They collaborated on a few home recording projects, although they never released anything commercially. After graduation, they went their separate ways, with Linnell playing keyboards in the Rhode Island new wave band The Mundanes. He eventually quit and relocated to Brooklyn, New York, where... Coincidentally, Flansburg was attending college at the Pratt Institute. They started making music together again, playing their first live show at a Nicaraguan Sandinista rally, billed as El Grupo de Rock and Roll. The show consisted of Linnell playing accordion, Flansburg playing guitar, the two of them splitting vocal duties, and a drum machine and other backing tracks handling the other instruments. Shortly after this, inspired by a passage from the 1619 novel Don Quixote, they adopted the name they would perform as to this day. They might be giants. They Might Be Giants are a band that does whatever they want, however they want it. Their music is pretty straightforward alternative rock, but they do it in their own quirky way. From writing songs about nightlights to the fact that I have a freaking accordion. Their quirkiness extends beyond the music too. For today's video, I'm going to be discussing They Might Be Giants and the ways in which they manage to do things their own strange way. Also, addressing the elephant in the room, a uh, different background, uh, I am home for winter vacation now, so that's why there's a lot more junk in the background since, you know, I lived here for 18 years. First off, let's look at what they're most well known for, their songs. While the music isn't exactly avant-garde, it's not exactly conventional, either. Case in point, their song titles and lyrics can be pretty cryptic and strange. On their self-titled debut album, there's a song called Put Your Hand Inside the Puppet Head. This is obviously a rather unusual phrase. Flansburg said in a Tumblr Q&A that the title refers to the idea that looking back on anything colors it in sentimentality, so the ultimate message is to wake up from that. This would make sense given lyrics such as, Yes, it's sad to say you will romanticize all the things you've done before. It was not 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 so great. It was not 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 so great. For further analysis of what the hell the phrase actually means, I went to the fan website, This Might Be a Wiki which I'm now fully convinced is the best website of all time. Website user Flux writes that the puppet head is the world of personal perception, the one most people confuse with reality. Putting your hand inside is a two-step process in which one first acknowledges the perceptual world as a sensory projection, the mere surface of all the manifold workings of the physical universe. The second step to putting your hand inside is acknowledging one's own inner sense of existence as being a direct link to the same manifold workings. Once these two steps are taken, a level of cynicism is attained, but the trade-off is that your consciousness, your hand, has at least achieved a semblance of empowerment to the extent that it can somewhat manipulate the same reality it perceives. Uh... Yeah, sure, that seems believable enough. Also, for what it's worth, this is apparently Weird Al's favorite song by them. Their next album, Lincoln, would feature a song titled Anna Eng. It's a love song of sorts, but not your typical one. The song describes reminiscing about a female pen pal on the other side of the world, one whom you've lived your entire life never being able to see. The first verse features some rather interesting lyrics. Make a hole with a gun perpendicular to the name of this town in a desktop globe. Exit wound in a foreign nation, showing the home of the one this was written for. Shooting a gun through a globe is not a visual that the band came up with themselves. Linnell said in an interview with Pitchfork that the song was inspired by a Pogo comic strip, which a character shoots through a globe. 
This makes sense when considering that Linnell has expressed his love of the Pogo comics and the other works of cartoonist Walt Kelly. Another rather cryptic lyric mentions being all alone at the 64 World Fair. Wiki user Mr. Tuck points out that 1964 was the same year that China launched its first nuclear test, which could potentially give us a time frame from when the song is set, but I don't know. As for why the song is titled the way it is, Linnell said he briefly became very interested in the last name Eng, given that, you know, has absolutely no vowels. Frankly, as far as songs written by white people about Asian women go, it's pretty good. Definitely beats Weezer. Their follow-up album, Flood, includes perhaps their most well-known song, Birdhouse in Your Soul. First things first, what's up with the title? Well, Linnell has said that it's a reference to Charles Mingus's Better Get Hit in Your Soul. The song itself is written from the perspective of a nightlight. Why a nightlight? Well, I actually couldn't find any specific reasons. As far as I can tell, they just wanted to write a song about a nightlight. Linnell did say in an interview with Rolling Stone that, since the melody was written long before the actual lyrics, the words had to be shoehorned in. Personally, I think the song's lyrics actually flow really well. Case in point, the first verse, I have a secret to tell for my electrical well, it's a simple message and I'm leaving out the whistles and bells, always sounded very pleasing to me, and since I managed to squeeze in a figure of speech without disrupting the flow of the song. The verse later goes on to mention the Longinus Symphonet brand of wristwatch to refer to the nightlight never resting. Probably my favorite lyrics in the entire song are in the second verse. The nightlight is discussing a photo of a lighthouse and laments, though I respect that a lot, I'd be fired if that were my job, after killing Jason off and countless screaming Argonauts referring to the Greek mythical hero Jason and his sailors, the Argonauts. And yes, the name Jason apparently goes back to ancient times. This is just one of those lyrics that you can tell the band members were really proud of themselves for coming up with. And they should be. They managed to not only write a coherent song about a nightlight, but one that includes references to wristwatches in Greek mythology. Finally, while it's not a song that they themselves wrote, and I don't have anything to say about it analysis-wise, it would be blasphemy if I went this whole video without name-dropping the classic Istanbul, not Constantinople. I mean, it's just an absolute banger. Even old New York was once New Amsterdam. Why they changed it, I can't say. People just liked it better that way. I'm gonna have that in my head for the rest of the day, but I don't really mind. If I discussed Everyday Might Be Giant's song that I thought had interesting lyrics, then this video would be five hours long. So, I'm gonna shift the topic to some songs of theirs that are a little lighter as far as themes go. In 2003, They Might Be Giants released No. This album was strikingly different from their previous works. While they kept their sense of humor and general weirdness, the song topics were all about positive, childlike themes. Take, for example, Robot Parade. This is a song I'm not gonna spend more than a sentence discussing because, well, it's not about anything other than a literal parade of robots. One song that I do think is pretty funny is Where Do They Make Balloons? The verses all follow a basic structure, listing various things that come from various places. For example, New York has tall buildings, New Jersey has its malls, Pisa has a leaning tower, will it ever fall? The ocean has the fishes, London has a tower, in Holland they have windmills, lots of bikes and pretty flowers. However, as the song points out, nobody knows where exactly balloons come from. The final verse features some classic humor they might be giants are known for, mentioning that, despite their names, Hungry isn't hungry, and Turkey doesn't have turkey. This is actually one of the few songs not written by Linnell or Flansburg, instead being written and sung by Danny Weinkoff, their bass player. After going back to adult music with 2004's The Spine, they released the first in what the wiki calls the Here Come trilogy, with 2005's Here Come the ABCs. As the title suggests, all of the songs in this album are about the alphabet. There's a song called E Eats Everything, which goes over the supposed eating habits of the letters. C only likes chocolate, G only likes gourmet, J only drink drinks juice, and so on. However, E will eat anything, no matter the setting. E is eating in a moving car. E is eating upside down. E is eating in a spaceship. E is eating off the ground. There's also a song about why the alphabet is in alphabetical order, called 
who put the alphabet in alphabetical order. In the song, they reach a conclusion that having the alphabet in a certain order helps us to remember what words there are. To prove this point, they straight up sing the alphabet towards the end of the song. They do have a point here, since basically everyone can sing the alphabet song from memory. No, I'm not going to do it now. Up next in the trilogy is 2008's Here Come the 1-2-3s. Quick question, do you know what a triops is? They're a type of crustacean that, as their name implies, have three eyes. If you look real closely, you can see it right above the two that are obvious. I mentioned this because this album has a song called Triops Has Three Eyes. For all of the children listening who don't know what a triops is, they make sure to explain that while we only ha need two eyes, triops have one that looks up and one that looks around and one to keep an eye on the other pair of guys. This isn't the only song on their album written about an obscure creature, as in Nine Bowls of Soup, they were singing about the ancient sea creature Ichthyosaur, constantly balancing nine bowls of soup. Though at all of his ordeals, the aquatic fellow never spills any. The band seemed amazed at this feat, since they didn't even know he liked soup. Fun fact, this album won the band a Grammy. The final album in the trilogy is 2009's Here Comes Science. This album has the first They Might Be Giant song I ever heard, I Am a Paleontologist. As is the case with Where Do They Make Balloons, this song is written by bass player Danny Weinkoff. It features some dinosaur names that would be pretty difficult for little kids to pronounce. Cause the treasures that I seek are rare and ancient things, like Velociraptor's jaw or Archaeopteryx's wings. To be fair, kids have to learn how to pronounce multisyllabic words at some point. Another interesting song is Why Does the Sun Shine? While the words themselves aren't as long as they are in the Paleontologist song, the lyrics as a whole are pretty loaded with, you know, lines like The sun is a mass of incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear furnace where hydrogen is built into helium at a temperature of millions of degrees. To be fair, nothing he's saying isn't true. This album had a good deal of chart success, mainly to the Grammy win of the previous album. It was on the Billboard's Kids Album chart for 54 non-consecutive weeks, which is the longest any of their albums have spent on any chart. So those are the first four children's music albums that They Might Be Giants wrote. They did release a fifth, 2015's Why, although I didn't discuss that due to it being more of a compilation album, although that does segue us into our next section. In late 1983, the two Johns were hit with a one-two punch of bad luck. Flansburg's apartment was burgled and all of his stage equipment stolen, while Linnell got into a bike accident and broke his wrist. Luckily, the thieves hadn't stolen Flansburg's four-track recorder, which meant they were still able to record basic music. Not wanting to completely halt playing, they decided to start distributing their music by way of an answering machine. Inspired by the Dial a Prayer phone line that the Boston Archdiocese formerly ran. This led to the creation of Dial a Song. Early on, the band name wasn't typically associated with the number itself. This was because, to save money, they would advertise the number in the personal section of the Village Voice newspaper instead of the business section. Since this is obviously not allowed, they didn't want the number to be traced back to them. But they initially recorded around 20 to 30 songs for the project. As the band gained a following, they began more openly associating their name with the project. As a result, it became one of the main things they were known for. The intimate nature of calling up and having a song played for you was part of the appeal. The two of them got into a flow of adding around six to seven new songs to their rotation every month. Early on, callers were able to leave messages on the machine, which led to some interesting pranks being played on the group. Flansburg recalled in an interview how one of their friends called up doing a very effective impression of famed music critic Robert Christgau and told them that they sucked. This apparently shook them up quite a bit until he realized it was a joke. Even crazier, some women who saw the number on flyers would apparently use it whenever creeps asked for their own phone numbers, leading to the machine being filled with messages from random thirsty dudes. Also, according to Flansburg, the record label execs didn't like that the project allowed fans to listen to music for free, that didn't stop them, however. As the project became more and more popular, the technical limitations became more noticeable. The use of tape-based answering machines meant that they went through quite a few of them. They briefly switched to a digital machine in 1998, but this went so badly that they switched back the next year. In addition, with people calling more and more often, the line was often jammed, which led to the humorous slogan, Always busy, 
often broken. In response to this, the band began utilizing the Dial-A-Song website more often. Eventually, in 2008, the phone number was disconnected, and they fully switched over to the website. The number was briefly revived in both 2015 and 2018. It's estimated that around 100 songs were played on Dial a Song during its original run. This includes one-off songs and demos that they would eventually flesh out more. The group themselves has said that all of the songs from the early albums were featured at some point. After the 2015 revival, their next three albums would be composed of songs featured on the project. Glean, the aforementioned children's album Why, and Phone Power. Dial a Song might not exist in its original form anymore, but it'll always be a part of the They Might Be Giants. There's one more thing I'm going to talk about regarding them. Something not necessarily song-related, but I find it interesting nonetheless. William Allen White was born on February 10th, 1868 in Emporia, Kansas. In 1895, he purchased the Emporia Gazette newspaper for $3,000. The next year, he gained national attention for an editorial he published entitled What's the matter with Kansas? In it, he criticized populist politicians for scaring away business owners from the state and causing economic stagnation. Thousands of copies were sent out during the 1896 presidential election, earning him national recognition. Throughout the rest of his career, his articles for the Gazette were widely reprinted across the nation. He became a spokesperson of the American progressive movement, providing aid to Teddy Roosevelt in the 1912 presidential election, and supported Woodrow Wilson's formation of the League of Nations. He also became one of the main proponents of small-town America while still understanding and respecting the needs of the increasingly urban United States. In 1896, a hundred years after the publishing of What's the Matter with Kansas, a group of 15 historians declared him to be the most influential person in the history of Kansas. Why am I mentioning all of this? Because They Might Be Giants seemed to really like using his image. Their early live shows would frequently involve large cutouts of his face, which would also be used in the music video for Put Your Hand Inside the Puppet Head. Not just that, but in the video for Birdhouse in Your Soul, the large crowd of people is wearing cutouts of his eyes. Early on, they didn't make it entirely clear who they were exactly using due to a fear of repercussions from his estate. As a result, people who didn't already know who William Allen White was were left somewhat confused. A review of a 1988 show in California assumed that the cutouts on stage were of former U.S. President Harry S. Truman, which... I guess I can see it. What's the deal with the group's fixation on Mr. White? Well, apparently they just really wanted to use some guy as their unofficial mascot. Linnell said they were inspired by a performance piece by Swedish artist Yvind Falström that involved people marching down the street holding massive pictures of Mao Zedong and Bob Hope. They originally wanted to use Orson Welles, but due to fear of being sued by his estate, they acquiesced to White because they thought he looked reasonably similar to Welles, and also because they just liked the way his face looked. Can't say I blame them. Fun fact, there's a website where you can buy random things with White's face on them. This includes everything from coffee mugs to thongs. There's something for everyone, I guess. So there you have it. They Might Be Giants have been doing things their own way for just about 40 years, and I hope I've given them proper respect. Honestly, I had to do something more than just a basic album guide video, since there's so much more to them than music. Plus, with 23 albums, a full proper album guide would end up being, like, an hour long, and nobody wants to see that. Would you? Now that I've told you so much about them, I want you all to go and listen to them. Personally, I would check out Flood, but any one of their albums would work, as they've never put out a bad release. No matter the album, as long as you give them a listen, that's what matters. If you haven't clicked off by now, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me your time. If you like what you saw, be sure to like and hit subscribe. I upload videos whenever I can, and I always have a ton of fun making them. Hopefully you have as much fun watching them. If you have a suggestion for a video you want me to do, leave it down in the comments. Who knows, maybe I'll get to it. I'm Robbie J2734. I will see you when I see you next.